please join me in welcoming uh, him today. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for a very kind introduction, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much for preparing uh, this absolutely wonderful weather. <laughs> and uh, to be frank, I, I've started to feel kind of homesick for snow since I spent uh, uh, not only several times in Moscow, but uh, I was born and grew up in a little, tiny, very snowy, cold town, which is called Fukui. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that uh, the University of Michigan is an indisputable leading institute in the American college sports world, <laughs> American football, <laughs> basketball, ice hockey, if I name a few of them. But however, it was a surprise, surprise. You also excelled in the academic achievement. <laughs> so thank you very much for the outstanding uh, work you do here at the Center for Japanese Studies. Over the years, JCS is a strong supporter of our mission to advance U.S.-Japan relations as well as Michigan-Japan relations. So as Consul General of Japan, I deeply appreciate your efforts. And also my uh, thanks goes to all of you who, uh, who blamed to come to <laughs> this lecture uh, because of this weather. <laughs> now, this afternoon, I'd like to give you an uh, update of recent political and economic development in Japan. Uh, and also, I'd like to touch on Japan-U.S. economic relations with, of course, a lot of emphasis on Japan's ties with this great state of Michigan. But as we are just only a couple of weeks into new year, January, so let me uh, properly address you as we do in Japan. Akemashite omedetou gozaimasu. Very happy new year to all of you. Now, as we look forward with uh, excitement at the uh, new year, brighter year of the, uh, 2012, let me pause to reflect on some of the challenges which the year 2011 has brought to Japan. As you, all of you know, even in the long history of Japan, we never ever experienced no such greater series of the disasters which did take place on March 11th in the year 2011. And uh, we've been paralyzed after hit after the earthquake, then hit by tsunami, and then nuclear accident followed. But despite the unimaginable tragic loss of precious lives and property, we are so glad that Japan has been warmly embraced, embraced and supported by the international community, and especially by close friend and ally, that is the United States. And I'm particularly grateful to the many local individuals, companies, academic institutions, and grassroots nonprofits such as local schools, churches, sister city clubs, and of course, people like you to reach out to help us in the most difficult time in the aftermath of earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear disaster. Many people in this area, area of the Anaba, also uh, quickly responded. And uh, my office has been literally uh, overwhelmed by the expression of the prayers, thoughts, and of course, precious donations. So let me take this opportunity to express on behalf of the people of Japan and government of Japan uh, to express my uh, sincere gratitude to all of you. Now, aside from the earthquake and tsunami, Japan was also hit or influenced by the flooding in Thailand and also European debt crisis, which is still uh, looming 
bigger and bigger over the horizons, which is another uh, concern for not only for Japan, but for entire world. And of course, many Japanese companies are struggling against the uh, continued extremely strong yen. But I'll tell you, we are working very hard, fever pitch, to rebuild ourselves. Slow but steady progress has been already made. And progress is a very substantial and rapid, much faster than I, we even expected. People back in Japan pulled together and are bringing the country back, back to the normal. And please, my friends, if there's one message which I can ask you to bring back with you, and that is uh, Japan is now safe. Japan is open for business. And Japan definitely welcomes all of you to visit in whatever the capacity, tourist, to study it, or just for fun. So please, next time when you have a chance, please check in our local air companies, air travelers, to book the earliest possible Delta airline ticket. <laughs> And I'll come back to the Delta Airlines. There is a reason for me to specifically mention Delta Airlines. But now, let me turn to the overall situation in Japan, especially when we talk about economic situation in Japan. There is a good news to share with you. Now, as for the forecast of the 2012 growth rate of Japan, we are going to see a rather robust economic growth in the year 2012. We are going to see that uh, more than 2% increase in the Japanese economy. And I quickly tell you for those who come from uh, very rapidly uh, developing countries, more than 2% growth sounds very, very modest, but for countries such as Japan with a huge economic size, more than 2% economic growth is a really something, especially in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. So overall economic uh, situation uh, is expected to be strong, and I hope that a uh, stronger way into the year 2013 and beyond as for the political side, well, last September, another new prime minister, and don't ask me how many prime ministers. <laughs> well, new prime minister, Mr. Yoshihiko Noda, he assumed the post of the prime minister back in uh, last September, and he quickly made it clear as his one of the highest priorities is first and foremost to continue post earthquake restoration and reconstruction efforts in Japan. But furthermore, Prime Minister also made it clear he would like to personally engage to Japan. Uh, to face with the challenges with Japan now struggling for some time. And that is uh, Japan's continued low birth rate and also very rapidly aging society. This dual trend, these dual issues are proceeding at a rate unmatched anywhere in the world, in the entire history of human beings. So, Prime Minister will focus on reforming Japan's social security and taxation systems in a very 
comprehensive manner. Of course, it will be not a small political task. So just this past week, Prime Minister reshuffled his cabinet and bring in stronger political allies within his cabinet so that he is better positioned to forge ahead with a daunting task of bringing in a national sales tax increase to deal with a budget crunch. Now, while Japan's government and the governmental leaders, including Prime Minister, are tackling these tough domestic economic issues, on the diplomatic and the security front, Japan will continue to be very much engaged. First, Japan will continue to provide necessary economic and political assistance to support to other countries that have also suffered natural disasters, such as Thailand and Turkey. We also, as staunch supporter of developing reform and democratization in the Middle East and North Africa, we are ready to provide with an ODA, Official Development Economic Aid, of approximately more than $1 billion in the new year for helping a newly really, uh, revelated Middle Eastern countries. We also decided to dispatch Self-Defense Forces peacekeeping peacekeep operations contingent to South Sudan. And as for the Asia, together with the United States, as well as other allies and friends, Japan will continue to pay close attention to the rather precarious transition period of leadership in countries such as North Korea and China. And as for the global economic theme, we are ready and willing to continue to be fully engaged and interconnected in a global economy and especially in the Asia Pacific region. To that end, Prime Minister Noda, while he met with President Obama last November in Honolulu on the margin of the APEC summit meeting, Prime Minister stated unequivocally his desire to join preliminary discussions on Japan's inclusion or participation in the multilateral free trade negotiations of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, known as TPP. If Japan were to participate this, in this dynamic nine-country member framework, the already robust economic relations between Japan and the United States in trade and investment could be dramatically expanded by facilitating greater economic activities in those sectors and areas such as agriculture, including a more increased import of the agriculture produce from the United States as well as the member countries. Of course, manufactured goods financial services, as well as some other areas also should be addressed once Japan uh, participate in this free trade agreement. Now, with that said as a kind of background, let me turn solely to US-Japan bilateral economic relations for a moment. And I know that there uh, some of you are already familiar with the numbers and statistics which I'm going to quote, but uh, just for the uh, sake of the uh, making sure, Japan and the United States, or United States and Japan, are still, and I hope continue to be, the number one 
and number three largest economies. And by the way, because of the strong yen, uh, if you uh, calculate the Japanese uh, GDP in the dollars, we might come back to the same power on China. But uh, putting aside, that's, that's the magic of the numbers. <laughs> now, together, United States and Japan account for more than 30% of the entire global economic output, and our countries are still very strong leaders in advanced research and development and manufacturing of commercial goods as well as industrial equipment. And between Japan and the United States, we register more than half of all new patents in the world. And the United States is Japan's second largest trade partner, while Japan is the United States' fourth largest trading partner. These numbers, are, of course, are, are very impressive, but I want to emphasize we are extremely interdependent as well. And our interdependence is evidenced by the volume of not only goods and services that flow between us, but the number of the businesses we establish in each other's countries, the amount of each other's stock we purchase and hold, and, of course, vast number of the flow of the people, tourists, students like you, researchers and teachers like you, and of course, some of them are uh, permanent visitors or permanent residents, while uh, some of them are short visitors. But the point is, we are continue to witness the ever increasing number of the flow of the people and together flow of the very important commodity, knowledge. Another indicator of economic interconnection is, you can see, in the amount of a mutual foreign direct investment and I tell you, as a consul general, I always love to talk about investment. Investment is the very basis for the future. Now, the United States has invested more in Japan than any other country, while Japan's foreign direct investment in the United States is the second largest, only after the United Kingdom. And Japan's investors are major private foreign holders of U.S. treasuries, second only to China. But if you take a look at the U.S. regions break down the geographic, uh, break down the United States in terms of the uh, economic relations. Then, I tell you, the Midwest, including the state of Michigan, is a major beneficiary. And I tell you, few states have benefited more than the state of Michigan. And if you remember, the first major wave of the Japanese investment came to Michigan in the late 1970s as well as early 1980s, and naturally, the automobile industry was the main attraction, and some of the early pioneering Japanese companies in Michigan, of course, included Toyota, which in 1977 opened a major technical center right here in Ann Arbor. By the way, Toyota right now uh, currently directly employs more than 1,000 employees, and uh, I'll share with you uh, last week, uh, Vice President of Toyota confided to me that uh, they plan to increase employment at the local uh, Ann Arbor facility for this new year. And of course, a few years later, Toyota's sister company, Denzo, Japan's largest auto supplier, established its own R&D facilities in Southfield, as well as 
one of the biggest manufacturing centers outside Japan in Battle Creek. So Japan is, and we are ready to be, continue to be the leading foreign investor in Michigan. And uh, let me share with uh, some of the numbers which uh, eloquent to show you how significant Japan's presence are in Michigan. There are now nearly 500 Japan-owned uh, Japan-related facilities here in Michigan across the state. And naturally, most of them are somehow related to the auto industry. Now, to put this in context, as I told you, more than 500, about 500 Japanese companies in Michigan. Now, if you take a look at the 10 Midwest states, all in all, 2,000 Japanese companies are located across the 10 Midwest states. So in other words, about a one quarter share of the investment are now here in Michigan. And these Japanese companies in Michigan currently employ more than 31,000 people in Michigan. Geographically speaking, I have noticed an interesting trend in terms of Japanese investment in Michigan. Of course, Japanese companies are currently concentrated in the metro Detroit, but there is a geographic investment pattern, I would say that the trend clearly indicates westward movement. So Metro Detroit moving to the city like Novi, Plymouth, Canton, and of course, Anaba. And there's another power center in Michigan, as I told you, that is a uh, Battle Creek area, including uh, some uh, small uh, group of the companies scattered in cities like uh, Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Now, those Japanese companies are now supported by uh, about uh, 10,000 Japanese populations, and most of them are uh, executive or employees, Japanese employees of the uh, Japanese companies and their family members. And most of them uh, live in the uh, eastern part of Michigan. And another ranks second only to Novi in terms of the Japanese national population that you can tell me why it is so. And of course, the answer is many Japanese people, about uh, 1,500 Japanese who reside in Anaba area, they undoubtedly attracted by the excellent quality of life, career opportunities, and wonderful educational institutions though so if I name a few of the reasons. And uh, of course, there are so many nice restaurants, <laughs> bars, place for home, place for farm. But as for the, if I take a close look at the educations, now, right now more than 10, right now more than 1,000 Japanese students teachers, researchers who currently study, research, or teach at the Michigan's network of the universities. And of course, University of Michigan is the largest recipient of the Japanese students. Now, I remember almost 30 years ago when I was still a very young uh, diplomatic cadet. At that time, it was a kind of a fashion for government in Japan to send young cadets to the East Coast or West Coast big name universities. i not gonna name any of them, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I was one of them. But now, believe me, last several years, government in Japan, including Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade and Industry, and Ministry of Defense, they sent many students right here to Michigan, including uh, University of Michigan. And this is a very impressive, I tell you, and uh, I repeatedly emphasize, 
they all come to study in Michigan in spite of the weather. <laughs> now, <clears throat> on the other side of the coin of the education, and that is uh, how our local American students are doing. And uh, of course, they are doing quite well or sometimes much better than their Japanese counterparts. They continue to be keenly interested in uh, studying Japanese language, which is not uh, easy to learn, and Japanese cultures, which is also no less easy. There are now more than 2,000 students enrolled in 16 Michigan colleges and universities who study, who are willing to study. Well, I don't know who are forced to study, <laughs> <laughs> whatever the reasons. More than 2,000 American students every day study Japanese languages and Japanese cultures, and I really appreciate for those young, talented kids who otherwise might be attracted by something else like uh, playing games <laughs> or playing football or playing basketball. But I'll tell you, studying Japanese will reward you later if you are a little bit patient enough and stick around for some time. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some of the faculty members who agree with me. Now, out of the 2,000, more than 2,000, believe me, UVM is, uh, of course, top this list with uh, more than 400 Japanese language students enrolled. And of course, we shouldn't forget about the wonderful sister state relations which the uh, state of Michigan has enjoyed with the prefecture of Shiga, which back, goes back to the 1968. And because of the wonderful sister state relations, some of the cities also encouraged to, to start a wonderful sister city relations. And right now, Michigan boasts of the more, uh, 27 sister city relationships. This is by far the most, not only in the Midwest, but entire United States. No other state enjoys such a closely kit sister city grassroots relations but Michigan. And of course, Ann Arbor enjoys a, such a wonderful relations with Hikone City. And because of these relations over the years, so many American students and Japanese students, they uh, mutually visit. And by the way, of course, the city of Hikone of also home to the Japan Center for Michigan Universities. And I hope that uh, some of you uh, already visited this wonderful center, which is located on the uh, bank of the beautiful Lake Beaver. And for those who have not yet uh, visited, I strongly recommend right after my speech, <laughs> check with your teachers how to apply for JCMU. And JCMU's three weeks gives you almost three year experience, mm -hmm. including a fun of studying Japanese. So believe me, and sometimes uh, you, uh, young people, you better believe someone like me or the people, so. <laughs> then why is Japan's presence so high in Michigan? Of course, Michigan is well known across the world for its rich engineering talent, the strong, very strong work ethic of its labor force, and of course, well-deserved reputation as the epicenter of the automobile industry, especially with a focus on research and development. So for example, Japanese companies who would like to do business in the automobile industry, they all know and they all fully understand we have to be here in Michigan.
because Michigan is continuing to be a power center of the automobile industry, and I'm sure that uh, uh, with a, a strong recovery of that big three, as well as a strong recovery of the uh, Japan three, and some other uh, foreign transplants from uh, Europe and Asian countries, I think that Michigan continue to be an epicenter of the entire global automobile industry. So that's why every major Japanese car maker and automobile parts supplier, they have located some kind of the facilities. It could be a research and development or a technical center or engineering facility or full-fledged production facilities here in Michigan. And I hope that the Japanese investment in the automobile industry has been a dynamic economic engine that has created thousands of high-paying, high-skilled jobs. And as I told you in the, uh, a little bit before, when we consider the strong yen and also very necessity of Japan's companies to balance their global strategy. I think that it makes perfect sense for them to continue to expand here in Michigan. And it is my great hope as a Consul General and I uh, waste no time to encourage my uh, colleagues uh, working in the Japanese companies so that they continue to see the wisdom and benefit of leveraging the huge and solid investment foundations in Michigan. And this, I think, uh, not only helps the companies themselves to grow and prosper, but this also boosts the local, state, and U.S. economies. And as I told you, there are now concrete and positive signs that many Japanese investment is poised for growth in Michigan. In fact, recently I conducted a series of the rather interesting and extensive discussions with some of the local Japanese companies' executives as well as a visiting executive from Japan. And I have heard very bullish plans for increased productions and local hiring, not only in the automobile industry, but in other sectors. By the way, I was just down at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit last week. And boy, I tell you, without exaggeration, Japanese and American automakers are all anticipate a very, very strong year this year. And while the rebound in the auto sector is, of course, indeed a welcome news because the automobile industry with a huge and multi-layer uh, industrial uh, structure, I believe that the automobile industry continued to set the pace for the economic growth and lead the rest of the economy. But there is, again, one key lesson we shouldn't forget, lesson which we had learned from earthquake and flooding and some other natural disasters across the world, and that is we have to continue to be diversifying our global business activities. Diversification is a very key to success. And to that end, I'd like to share with you, since you come all the way to listen to me, so I hope that uh, you have to learn something new from me. So I'd like to share with you some of the targeted industrial areas where my office, as well as my partners in the Japanese and American business sectors now working on. There are four areas where I do believe Michigan-Japan economic relations 
could be or should be expanded and diversified. First, are you ready to take note? <laughs> I'd like to see more spin-off ventures from the current strong automobile basis. And great example of the spin-off of the automobile industry is the field of the energy storage, of course. Now, there is a now great momentum underway between our companies with American partners in the development of the lithium ion as well as some other kind of the batteries with exciting applications, of course, in and beyond the automobile industry. Besides the battery sector, another very interesting spin of the trend which I have noticed, and that is the auto industry and the auto parts industries, they try to transfer their expertise into medical device industries. And there is a reason. And uh, since I'm a completely layman, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but I was told that uh, those folks who work in uh, uh, automobile parts industries, because of their talent and the training skills, they are quite good with a proper retraining in the medical device industry because both automobile parts and the medical device needs a lot of uh, precision and precisive uh, craftsmanship and the manufacturing. Now, right here at your backyard in Anaba, a company by the name of Imura, 20 years ago, it was a spun off from a local Japanese auto supplier, and now Imura became a, has become a global leader in ultra fast fiber laser technologies with uh, many applications in the medical industry. So this is just one of the examples of how automobile industries and auto parts industries could branch out into the new industries such as the medical device industries. And there's another area where I can see exciting spin-offs, and that is, of course, composite material. Traditional materials such as plastics, metals, carbons, you name it, they are now being transferred into cutting edge composites and their applications. And as a result, traditional products, of course, including automobile, airplanes, homeland security equipment devices, just about everything produced, they are becoming lighter, stronger, and more efficient and much easier to use. And I'd like to emphasize, they can be more eco-friendly. Now, as you might be familiar, there are quite a few Japanese companies which are excel in the field of the advanced composites. And thus, they are becoming increasingly integrated partners with uh, American industrial leaders. For example, excuse me, just last month, a new joint venture was announced between General Motors and Japan's leading carbon fiber producer named Teijin to produce lightweight old composites for the mass market. Now, they have not yet announced where they're going to open their new facility. And uh, believe me, I am working very hard. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm not shy away from even uh, twisting their arms to bring them come to Michigan. Now, second area where we can deepen economic ties involves, of course, uh, it's much relevant to you guys, technology and intellectual property transfers between public sectors, including uh, academic, to the marketplace. And I feel that there could be even greater synergies, or should be much, much robust synergy effect between Japanese companies and their local American academic partners, entrepreneurs, 
and even the individual researchers. For example, last, last autumn, when I accompanied Governor Snyder to visit Tokyo, among other things, we uh, struck the final deal so that now Michigan's Molecular Institute, which is, by the way, located in the city of the Midland, Michigan's Molecular Institute is going to start a joint venture with Tokyo's Eco Research Institute, and they are going to start production, or actually, they are going to turn shredded waste paper. And by the way, you have abundant of the shredded waste paper in uh, uh, classrooms and academic institutes and uh, government uh, offices. So they are going to start a production so that they can turn shredded waste pa paper into a stronger and more eco-friendly paper plastic composite. And again, I'm not going to uh, tell you the concrete name of the food industry, but one of the biggest, widely known American food industry is also partnered with Michigan Molecular Institute and this Tokyo Eco Institute so that they can use newly created plastic papers for their use. And uh, those who are quick enough, you have already figured out which company I'm talking about, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I would say that uh, especially in these areas of the collaborations between uh, academic institutes with uh, companies, I think that uh, University of Michigan can be or should be a leader. Let me consider the strengths of your outstanding material science, chemistry, and engineering programs. Now, third area in which we'd like to deepen our economic ties between Michigan and Japan, we shouldn't forget about the rather traditional areas or areas where we take it for granted so we have abandoned or we simply neglect it for quite some time. I'm talking about industries or areas such as agriculture and food processing and water related business. And of course, Michigan still carries the name of the Great Lakes State. So we shouldn't forget about how to take care of the water and at the same time, how to make water into the rather lucrative business opportunities. But let me start with uh, uh, another uh, abundant uh, resources which enjoy during the summer times, and that is uh, solar energy. Now, I don't think I could point to a better example of the mid-Michigan and Japanese collaborations than Saginaw's Hemlock Semiconductor Corporation. This is a joint venture between Dow Chemical and Japanese partners, Mitsubishi Materials and Shinetsu Handotai. Now, Hemlox employs more than 2,000 workers had, and has invested more than $2.5 billion in Saginaw plant, and they plant increase their facilities. Now, this company, joint venture of the American with the Japanese company, is now a world leader in the production of a polycrystalline silicone, and don't tell me what it is, but uh, this is very important key ingredient in solar panels and many consumer electronics, such as iPhones. This facility is a wonderful example of our companies working together for a cleaner and greener future and of course, as I told you, Michigan is a state of Great Lakes. So Michigan could and should be a leading state when it comes to the water management and the water technologies. And 
Don't forget, Michigan has a wonderful sister state relations with Shiga Prefecture, which, by the way, is a home to the biggest, by Japanese standard, lake, Lake Biwa. <laughs> so I would say that uh, Michigan and Shiga Prefecture are just a natural match for leading a water business and water management. And uh, I'm glad that uh, this week, uh, my office had uh, uh, another uh, joint project with uh, your rival university, Michigan State University. We uh, just finished with uh, one of the wonderful seminars about water management. And uh, we brought a uh, uh, leading professor from uh, Shiga University to come to visit. And I'm sorry I didn't turn to the University of Michigan, but uh, as a consul general, I have to keep a balance. So <laughs> I try to be nice to everybody, like a typical Japanese diplomat. But anyway, <laughs> so water, water is very important. And with water, with water, what comes? What comes? Come on. Of course, nice, healthy food. This is uh, agriculture and food processing. And uh, Governor Snyder repeatedly uh, explained to me that Michigan, oh, by the way, he also said uh, yesterday in his uh, State of the State Union speech, Michigan, believe me, one, believe Governor, <laughs> has a second largest crop diversity in the United States. So, Governor Snyder has set a goal to double Michigan's agriculture exports in the next five years. And let me consider where Japan and Japanese companies of any relevant in this agriculture business. And I soon realized that uh, with our advanced technologies and investment, as well as, uh, as I told you, aging populations and uh, very uh, health oriented consumers back in Japan, for example, Michigan's abundant blueberries, cherry, apple, cranberries, and uh, you name it, those agricultural produce can be a great materials for the food processing industries. And by the way, there is a concrete example, and again, last autumn, Tokyo's Otsuka food and Graceland fruit of Frankfurt, Michigan, they agreed to start a joint ventures. And there's another example, and right here, again, in another area. And by the way, I understand that uh, Michigan also produced a lot of uh, soybeans, yep. right? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, one Japanese company by the name of American Soy Products, or oh, by the way, this is a, a commercial, very uh, savvy way to name the company American Soy Products, <laughs> actually Japanese-owned company. Now, American Soy Products, they're located just outside Anaba. They process it locally grown soybeans into soy milks, and they sell them under the Eden Foods brand. So this is another example. Now, fourth, and finally, I think uh, we, we need uh, more efforts in marketing and promotion of Michigan as a tourist destination, as a recreation destinations. And I'm telling you, not because my elder son, he just graduated from university and he started to work for the biggest Japanese travel company. I'm not talking because of my sons, but still I believe <laughs> tourism, travel industry is one of the most or fastest growing industries entire world. And by the way, every year, so many Japanese tourists, they love to fly to Alaska or Canada, but not 
Michigan. <laughs> and they come to Alaska or Canada, and they are not coming for gold, but they are coming for wonderful experience in nature. Nature trekking, hunting, fishing, sometimes golfing, camping, you name it. Then you don't tell me Michigan cannot compete against Alaska or Canada. You are not a sissy, right? <laughs> so let's think about how we put our institutional efforts between some of the Japanese companies, such as Delta Air, or Japanese, not Japanese <laughs> company, I'm sorry, <laughs> JAL, or Nippon Airways, as well as American partners like Delta with a Michigan institution, so that we can bring Michigan back on the center of the radar of the tourist industries. And, and as I told you that uh, Michigan uh, can provide uh, visiting tourists. By the way, I have to tell you that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, tourism industries, we don't not necessarily concentrate on the visitors from Japan, but beyond Japan. There are so many uh, middle class agents, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, Taiwanese, Indonesians, they also love to fly all the way to the uh, United States. So we also tap into those potential tourists. And uh, when it comes to the what Michigan could provide, and uh, you know better than me that uh, in addition to the beautiful natures, you can also provide them with uh, wonderful experiences. And of course, you can also provide them with a wonderful tasting of the local wines, local breweries, by the way. Uh, I'm gonna uh, show you this uh, small secret. This year, we started to uh, import a local wine from Michigan to Japan. So I would say that uh, uh, Michigan uh, strategically located when it comes to the uh, flow of the people and because Michigan is now served by two most important uh, international airports, Metro Detroit and Chicago's O'Hara Airport. And don't tell us, Chicago, uh, Chicago Airport is located in the next neighboring state. Who cares? <laughs> if Chicago Airport, uh, every day, JAL and uh, or Nippon Airways, they uh, serve a direct flight from Narita Airport to Chicago, why don't you come up with whatever the pretext to allure the visitors from Chicago to make a one or second leg extended to Michigan? At least western part of the Michigan should be covered by the uh, Chicago airport. We also have to be nice to the neighboring states. So, and as for the uh, Metro Detroit, Metro Detroit airport, this is the only American airport which is directly connected to the three Japanese airports of Narita Airport outside Japan, Haneda Airport, downtown Tokyo, and Nagoya Airport. So Metro Detroit is the only American airport which is directly connected with the three airports. No airports in the West Coast East Coast, or the rest of the United States, have such a wonderful gateway capabilities. And thanks to the Delta Airlines. So that's why <laughs> I think that we specifically recognize and acknowledge Delta Airlines service. Now, I have outlined, I'm sorry, I have taken too much time. So I have outlined four areas in which our economic relations can expand, but let me briefly touch upon how to uh, materialize or realize those areas into the more uh, concrete ways. And uh, as I told you, the reason why many Japanese companies, they decide to uh, locate here in Michigan, and uh, first and foremost, because of the availability of the educated and the skilled workforce here in Michigan. So, I think that uh, if you think about the four areas where we are going to uh, explore in the future, in the near future, we have to think about how to uh, bring uh, companies from the one hand, from the academics, from the other. And uh, 
I think that uh, for this matter, University of Michigan and uh, Japan centers can play uh, some role. Now, currently, my office is embarking on efforts to connect Japanese companies to the nearly 2,200 university students and 400 of them are now studying at the University of Michigan. We try to uh, match American students with uh, Japanese language skills and Japanese culture and whatever the knowledge with uh, Japanese companies and American companies who do business with Japan. So if there are students, I'm glad that some of the students still remain, <laughs> if you're interested in how to materialize your dream, and the first thing you have to do is why don't you uh, sign up in uh, Japanese studies or Japanese language studies? I think that's going to be the first step to take. And of course, you also consider apply for the studying in Japan uh, through the framework of the Japan Center for Michigan University program. And the uh, University of Michigan is one of the most active member of the JCMU. And I also ask uh, those uh, students who happen to study Japanese, or who happen to be exposed to the Japan culture, think about for your future opportunities, apply for the JET program. JET, by the way, stands for the Japan Exchange of Teaching. And by this program, uh, you will be uh, provided uh, with the opportunity of the work in Japan, either as an assistant English teachers or international coordinators, two years, or with the extended uh, possibility of the extension. And as I told you, for those who are returning from Japan or for those who continue to study here in Michigan, as I told you, we try to come up with a job matching opportunities. So what I try to tell you is what I told in the very beginning. Studying foreign language is not easy. And I know, I know by heart. It was a grueling and most miserable uh, experience for me while I was put in a DLI, Defense Language Institute. And you know, I was, I was not lucky as you are. I was surrounded not by teachers like uh, nice Japanese teachers, but I was put in a classroom where the presiding professor was a proud alumni of the Imperial Moscow University. <laughs> and uh, as a typical Jewish lady, every time I made uh, mistakes, she literally hit me. <laughs> on my hands by measures <laughs> and, his, and uh, using uh, any kind of uh, words which you can uh, expect to hear from your stone-faced Russian mother. <laughs> <laughs> but because of that, I can somehow survive and uh, now I, I ended up as an official interpreter for emperor and prime minister and foreign minister in Russian. So I tell you, you, all of you who study here in the University of Michigan or any other institutes or in Japan, you are much, much luckier because uh, you are surrounded by, first and foremost, nice, caring teachers in the wonderful academic facilities. And whenever you need, you always count on someone like me, another caring diplomat. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>